Magnet television. Magnet television. Magnet television. You're watching Magnet television because what else are you going to do? My name is Sid Butler, and I play bass in the HE band on Late Night with Seth Meyers. I play in the Sabi Fav and run French Kiss Records. I'm also part of the trio of Office Romance, which has released a holiday record this year. Hi, I'm Amy Carlson from Office Romance. Hi, I'm Seth Jabour, Aries. I have no food allergies. The answer to that impossible question will be somewhere over the rainbow. I think it's just lasted the test of time, and I've always enjoyed singing it to my kids. It always makes me feel good when I sing it, and it's just a beautiful song. Wild is the Wind by Nina Simone for its passion and longing and these seemingly discordant elements. The emotion is so strong and it's juxtaposed with this incredible piano. It's an amazing song. Well, that's easy. Michael Jackson's Human Nature off of Thriller. It's, uh, it's great. It is a, like, just perfect, airy pop song um, supported by, uh, in my opinion, one of Steve Luthiker's best guitar lines ever and you know Quincy Jones production I mean you really can't say anything bad about the song probably one of those kind of songs that's been with me ever since I like first started experiencing music uh, on my own you know for the first time uh, and I still love it and I think it's a beautiful song I remember specifically when someone handed me a tape of Bad Brains and it was over. It reached inside my soul and grabbed me and has never let me go. So the record that changed my life was Bad Brains by Bad Brains. I'm going to have to go with Sinead O'Connor, Lion and the Cobra. And the reason that I'm not choosing like the Smiths Meet His Murder is because during that time, I was an angry teen and looking for a female voice that expressed that. And living in the suburbs of Chicago, like when Sinead O'Connor came out, she just really, something about her voice um, really connected with me, uh, connected me to the music and uh, there was just a real vacuum of female voices at that time. I mean, I loved Chrissy Hine and The Pretenders, but it just wasn't capturing what I wanted um, on a, an emotional level. And Sine did that with Lion and the Cobra. I think I would say Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me by The Cure. Um, that record had a... Uh, a pretty profound effect on me um, not just in the way that like I think about playing music but it was like my gateway record into um, you know like alternative music like post new wave and punk and like all that kind of stuff um, and also The Cure became one of my favorite bands, you know, during that time for like many years uh, and even like to this day I mean, there are still albums of theirs that I love listening to, songs of theirs that I think are, are great and, and, and with, with, withstood the test of time but it was Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me that sort of allowed me to branch off from, you know like commercial radio into something new and, and exciting for me at the time I would say it was Bugazi in Washington, D.C. on the Capitol Hill steps. They were playing a benefit and they were playing the song Blueprint. And midway through the song, the power 
left. It unplugged, something happened. And Brendan Cantu, the drummer, just kept playing. He kept this cool as if they had planned it. And everyone's running around trying to plug the amps back in and see where the power source was disrupted or derailed. And all of a sudden they looked at each other, Brendan did a drum roll, and they all came in at the part of the song where Ian sings, never mind, never mind. And the crowd went bananas. And it was a time in my life where I realized that you were, you could control everything in the song. You could be playing perfectly. You could practice the song. And then something derails it that's completely out of your control. And then you sort of are so cool and able to take advantage of it and then heighten the song when you come back in. And then only did I feel even closer in that moment to the band and to the song because I was a part of the process of them trying to figure it out. And they handled it so well that I realized as an up and coming musician that I would make plenty of mistakes and there'd be things that were outside of my control that I couldn't handle. And that's fine. And in fact, it's how you recover from those mistakes that allows your audience to either connect to you even more, or if you, you know, get mad at your bandmates or get frustrated that that might push your audience away. But it was a huge learning moment in my, in my youth of just seeing like, oh, here are these guys that do this all the time. They're so good at it. They don't have a set list. They're just in it. They're in the moment. They're so present. And then something derailed that present moment and they just shrugged it off and smiled at each other and Canty kept his cool and, you know, they elevated the song at a perfect time. They were great. It was a great moment. I think I'm going to have to go with Built to Spill at Irving Plaza like a month after 9-11 in New York. Uh, Built to Spill came to New York and played there and the city was so wounded and Doug Marsh just opened his heart and it was a profound experience to be there coming together with all these New Yorkers with the gentle open nature of Built to Spill and I think there was not a dry eye in the house that night. I would say Radiohead uh, when they performed at Coachella in 2003. Um, and prior to that, I had only experienced them on record. So I think I had probably like modest expectations, you know, like I was looking forward to seeing them, but I w wasn't prepared for like how incredible that show was um, and how that band managed to bring all of the sounds and textures and atmosphere of their music and then like almost perfectly recreate it on stage. Um, you know, like the hairs on the back of my neck were standing up when I watched them. It practically ruined me for live music. The 75 were playing live on KEXP and I was kind of exhausted and from tour driving or something and discombobulated. And I remember the song started playing and I was still tuning and fussing about. And then halfway through the song, I was like, hey guys, 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 cause I'm ready now. And they looked at me continuing to play along like I was crazy. And then I was like looking back at them all stupid and stuff. And at the end of the song, I barely played anything. And they had done an excellent job of playing it perfectly. And on live radio, I basically had not played at all, then had the audacity to say, can we do it again? Because I wasn't paying attention. I wasn't ready. And they all laughed at me. Uh, that was one of many embarrassing moments. But you could also toss up to the fact that we played a show in Austin, Texas, and I just r stepped funny and ripped my pants in the groin from knee to knee and continue, continue to play the show. But that wasn't so much embarrassing. That was like, ah, oh, that's a Le Sauvignon live show versus like me just being a total dumbass on live radio and not playing the song because I wasn't ready and paying attention. But I have a lot of embarrassing stories. When I was a teen, I thought I was pretty cool. And I was at a Naked Ray Gun concert at the Metro in Chicago. And I, Stage dove a couple times and then I was really into it thinking I was hot stuff and I 
stage up right at the end of the song. So everyone went, went from this to this and they were clapping and I woke up propped up against the wall by a bouncer because I had knocked, gotten knocked out because no one, no one caught me. Whoops. Uh, so uh, my old band and I, uh, you know, we played a gig in Melbourne and there was a band over there at the time that we were really into and we were uh, like really excited to meet them. They came to the show um, and then we put on like a really, I would say a pretty like lame performance. I don't even remember why. It just was like a really lackluster show. I don't think we played that well. I don't think the audience really responded that well. I think we kind of knew that we were like floundering. And then like after the show, I don't even think, I don't remember if this band like stuck around to say goodbye or, you know, do one of those like phony, like, hey, good show, man. I kind of feel like they just were like, let's just get the fuck out of here so that we don't have to talk to those guys. Anyway, that was kind of embarrassing. Sine.